Hi, everyone. I'm very happy to be here today. It's my first time in Paris. Yeah, no one's excited about that? Come on. <laughs> I'm excited. I've only seen the train station in my hotel so far. But you all look nice. Um, so I have three things I want to share today. Uh, the first is I want to give you some context uh, on how I see materials technology and specifically the three generations of engineered biology and engineered materials, where we are, where we're going, and where I think we one day will reach. Two, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what my company Ecovative does and how we use mycelium, the root structures of mushrooms, to grow materials at industrial scales through consumer-designed products. And lastly, uh, I'm going to actually announce a new material for the first time ever today uh, that we've been working on at Ecovative for the last five years. So let's jump in. I broke this uh, into three sections, microbes, mycelium, and magic today. Microbes uh, are about using single-celled organisms, uh, like you just heard, feeding them sugar and fermenting all sorts of cool compounds, synthesizing molecules. Mycelium is like a microbe and could be considered a microbe, but it doesn't just synthesize molecules, it assembles them into complex structures. In fact, the largest complex organism in the world is a mycelial organism that lives in western Washington state and spans hectares and hectares. And the last part, the magic, is where I think we end up when we push living technology to the absolute limit. Or the chicken. One of my goals today is to convince you that this chicken is the most advanced technology on planet Earth you have access to, far more so than your iPhone or your computer. But let's start with the forest. Uh, George Church said this best about forests. Biology has the ability to synthesize uh, molecules at the atomic scale. So you have atomic scale precision of molecules, yet it's almost infinitely scalable. That's what a forest is. You could start with a seed or a blade of grass, and you could cover an entire continent in this incredible ecosystem. Forests create incredible materials as well. This is where we got pine. Particle board, which which you'll see throughout this building and is used for a lot of building construction. It comes in big sheets. Uh, has a breaking strength of about 1,500 PSI. It's pretty good. It was enabled by our chemical revolution. But if you compare that to pine, a natural material, pine's about eight times as strong. Now, pine has a disadvantage in that it doesn't grow in flat one meter by two meter sheets, but it's still significantly stronger than our best chemical wood equivalent. And it's not even the strongest wood in the forest. You have woods like oaks and other hardwoods that are even stronger than pine. And these materials are strong because nature doesn't just synthesize cellulose, it assembles cellulose and lignin in a very intricate and special way. So 1950, we had the chemical revolution. You just heard a little bit about that. This was our first glance at molecular nanotechnology. We broke things like natural gas or petroleum into little tiny molecules, molecules like styrene. And then with heat and pressure, we built them back up into materials like styrofoam. Incredible materials, incredible properties. They've obviously changed the way we live on planet Earth. But they have come at an incredible, tremendous even, environmental cost. You heard about it, what is happening in the oceans. You see plastics in your park. And the big issue with these materials is while we've created really cool new chemistries, they're not compatible with Earth. Right? They're clogging up our oceans, they're clogging up our airways, and they won't go away. But microbes are offering a solution. Dan just talked about one of the most beautiful things being fermented today, which is his spider silk. I think this is a brilliant invention. You take sugar, you take microbes, you put them in a fermenter, you make a molecule. You're using half of what life gave us in terms of incredible technology. Atomic level precision to make molecules. Then you use conventional chemistry technology to take these single monomers and build them into longer strands of polymers. Now, these are far better polymers, right? They're safer, they're healthier, they're better for the planet, they have, they have new properties, as you heard about. But there's more we can do. Because a tree is strong, not because it makes cellulose and lignin, but because of the way that tree carefully puts each molecule of cellulose and lignin around itself, right? It's a molecular assembler. That's what we're doing at Ecovative with mycelium. Mycelium synthesizes molecules, like a microbe, and then it builds structures. This time lapse in the background, which goes on for about 72 hours, condensed into 30 seconds, is actually mycelium growing from these single white dots. 
What you're seeing is it's synthesizing the enzymes it needs to grow. It's synthesizing chitin, which is what makes up its cell wall. But we're not extracting that, squishing it up, and then pushing it back out and making a mycelium material. We're letting the organism assemble that in 3D space, molecule by molecule, through and around these particles. This product you see here, after three days, gets dried and is turned into a styrene-like material used for packaging. This was the first product we launched. We launched it because we care about plastic pollution. We launched it because we wanted to change the packaging industry. And we launched it because mycelium is the right material properties for this industry. If you get the packaging uh, on your left, you can compost that in your garden. It's a nutrient, not a pollutant. And we've used this with big customers like Dell. We've perfected this process at our labs in Green Island, New York. And we're now licensing it and working it with entrepreneurs as well as customers around the world to bring this technology to other regions. We've also built massive structures using mycelium technology. This 40-foot tower uh, was on a pavilion at the Museum of Modern Art uh, last summer. It's a performing art space, withstood some incredible windstorms. It was designed by a brilliant architect, David Benjamin, um, for two reasons. One, to show that you actually can build really large structures using these new materials. Um, and two, to show the full circle of life when you work with materials that are 100% bio-based. This structure was decommissioned in the fall. It was taken to a composting facility in Brooklyn and was turned into soil to grow food in the city. It's a pretty cool way to use building materials. Most recently, we've been exploring design and interiors uh, because we think it's really important to connect to individuals and particularly consumers to explain the benefits of these materials. Um, these lamps were done by a designer, Danielle Trophy. She designed and grew them using our Grow It Yourself kits and just launched these and had a very successful Kickstarter that closed last week with over 300 sales, $25,000 raised for her new business. And we're trying to bring this technology to as many people as we can. At grow.bio, you can visit, and you can actually get the same substrate we use in our factory. If you're an artist, a designer, or a student, and you want to start working with these materials, you can order a bag online, add water, and you can do this in your kitchen. Uh, put it in a mold, and you can grow anything you desire. This is a, a plant pot. So magic, living objects. Let me start with my favorite quote. Any, sufficient, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Arthur C. Clarke. What was he talking about? He's talking about an iPhone. This is magic, right? Tells you where you are, anyone on Earth, communicates with geosynchronous satellites, does all sorts of amazing things. This is really what sci-fi was about in the 1950s, and we're experiencing it now. But Arthur C. Clarke didn't see the magical technology that was all around him, and I think we still don't today. And I'll give you an example of this now, and I think you'll see where I'm going. Uh, this is a device I've been working on in my spare time. It's called the Eggtron. Everyone here want to know these Keurig machines are? You put a little cup in, it makes a coffee. You guys seen those? No one seen one? You've seen them, OK. So it's just like that, and I'm trying to unite this trend. People want this fast, on-demand coffee. They want fresh food every morning. So the concept behind the Eggtron is you get a, let's call it a, a cure egg. It's this little cup filled with starch and water. You put it in the top of this box. It's about you know, this tall, this wide. In the morning, out pops an egg. Now, if you try and do this using conventional material science or conventional chemistry, it turns out it's really hard to turn starch and water into an egg. You've got this shell that's a breathable membrane. You've got all the cool proteins inside the egg. There's no way you can do this on someone's counter. But I think you can all imagine what you could do, where you could go in nature and find something, put it in a box, strap some LED lights on it, put some starch in it, out comes an egg, right? <laughs> you put a chicken in the box. Now, you may think I'm being facetious, but if I tell you a chicken is advanced technology, you're like, yeah, whatever. But if I tell you I have a magic box that takes starch and makes eggs and it fits on your kitten chicken counter, it's kind of amazing. Now, I live on a farm. Uh, the chickens occasionally get in the house. I have a really sweet chicken called Sweetie who gets on the counter occasionally. And I don't recommend this. It's really gross. Chickens are happy outside. We should keep them outside. But chickens are actually unbelievably complicated technology that do unbelievable things. And this is where I think the ultimate end for material science, biological-based materials, and biological technology will end up. So I like to say any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from nature. 
Now, returning to material science, some of the amazing materials we talked about today, like wood or bone, have tremendous properties after they're done living. But if you look at these materials in action, they are at their best when they're performing other functions. Take bone, for example. Bone doesn't just hold your body up, right? It actually produces red and white blood cells, right? This is like the structural component is a side effect of all these other things it does when it's living. Trees don't just make wood to build buildings out of. They clean our air. They capture photons, ethereal packets of energy, and they convert them into wood. It's unbelievable technology condensed into a leaf. So materials, these materials are actually at their best when they're alive. Because when things that are alive, they have functions. Just like when a chicken's alive, its function it can be to create an egg. So what would living objects look like? What would living materials look like? Well, not surprisingly, there's, there's limited new examples. This is the third epic in a three generations uh, cycle we're on for biotechnology and biomaterials. But I did want to share one today that was released commercially just a few months ago. This is called Orbella. It's a genetically engineered moss that produces fragrances like you'd find from these plug-in Febreze air fresheners. Now, this may not seem like it's fulfilling an important need, but I think it's the tip of the iceberg of where we're headed. Because think about a plug-in air freshener. I don't know if they're large here, but everyone in the US seems to have them, and they're terrible. They consume electricity. They release phthalates into the air, these toxins you really shouldn't be breathing in. They're almost impossible to recycle, and they create all this waste at the end of their life. Here you have the exact opposite. You've got a moss you can keep in your kitchen or your living room. It runs on sunlight and water. It's been engineered to produce the same sorts of scents that humans seem to want, and it cleans your air. This is just way better technology. And if it breaks or it wears out or your dog knocks it over and it gets dried out, you can actually compost it in the garden or outside in the street. It becomes nutrients for something else. And this is, for me, even though um, I'm not big into scented scents in my home, one of the coolest inventions of the year. So I think it's pretty exciting. And I think this is just the beginning. Uh, what Dan described, what I've described with mycelium, is just scratching the surface of what nature has created for us and gives us the tools to allow us to live on this planet for hundreds of thousands of more years in balance, which I really want to see happen. I, I like humans. I like to see what pe humans create. And we really need to do that by living in a sustainable fashion. But I do have one more thing. Over the last five years at Ecovative, We've been working not just on hard structural composites for doors or for furniture, but we've been developing fabric-like materials. Um, and we've been developing fabric-like materials using the structure of mycelium, which is quite unique. It's combined of chitin and beta-glucans. And this summer, we started developing these sheets of materials, which is a new textile. It's comprised of 100% mycelium. There are no fibers or other particles combined in this. And it takes advantage of both of nature's strengths. The mycelium synthesizes the structure you see here, and it assembles it into the form of this sheet. So we don't put this sheet together later in an extruder. We don't heat it up, the molecules up, and have it bind into the sheet. This sheet literally grows out. We extract it from the material, and you get a flexible, beautiful material. It's not vinyl. It's not silk. It's not leather. It's new. And it's rare to have new materials come along. And it's exciting for designers and artists, the folks we want to partner with, because that brings new properties new design possibilities. We've just started testing with a couple of large brands in activewear and accessories. We're very excited to talk to artists and designers who might find other applications for this. As I said, it benchmarks well against leather. It benchmarks, interestingly, against silk, but it's not any of those materials. Um, and lastly, because it's important to eat your own dog food, uh, I've been given a wristband, a watchband, made by my co-founder, Gavin McIntyre, which I'm, I'm wearing here today. Um, I have a reputation for being unbelievably hard on clothing and other mechanical things. Um, I've been careful to get here with it, but I'm going to be giving it a good test on my way home. And I have to say it feels wonderful on my skin, and I'm happy to be sharing it here with you today. If you're interested in learning more about this, we've just set up a website. You can order samples. Actually, you can pre-order samples at the moment. Uh, it's textile.bio. And if you want to grow your own materials at home, I encourage you to visit grow.bio. Thanks so much for your time.